in fact, let me let me even start with a small uh, plan for this uh, first session. We're going to have a talk for 50 minutes and then a 10 minute break from 3.50 BST, so British summertime to 4 p.m. British summertime, followed by another talk. And then uh, at 4.50, there will be a longer break, 4.50 British summertime. And um, on that, I am I am very pleased to introduce our first speaker. Um, our first speaker, uh, University of Oxford. She researches uh, fundamental issues in physics. Uh, in particular, um, in a recent research, she's worked uh, on a new fundamental theory of physics called constructor theory, which is a generalization of quantum information theory. I should also mention that she recently published a, a good book about it. Um, if, if people are interested to know more, I think it's called The Physics of Can and Can't. On that, uh, Chiara, uh, please have the floor and please correct me if I misintroduced uh, your book. No, no, that's great. Thanks. Um, mm -hmm. Thanks, Charles, for this. Um, and um, Thank you and, and Sam for organizing the, the conference. Uh, so I'm kind of very, very happy to be able to, to speak at, um, uh, at this conference. It's very nice. Um, I think my talk um, will be exploring things that are in a way related to Everettian quantum theory, but um, we'll try to go beyond it in some way. And, I'm hoping to keep this um, open so that we can have a nice conversation. Maybe some things I will say are slightly uh, controversial, so I'm very happy to, um, to have a good discussion going. Um, and so interrupt me at any point if you want to have clarifications or anything as I'm going along, because it's very a very informal uh, presentation. That's why I called it Musings on the Universality of the Quantum Multiverse. Um, so the starting point, will be this, this particular thing in Everett's work that um, I find very interesting. And that's one of the aspects of the particular way that Everettian um, the quantum theory, um, you know, the, the Everettian take on quantum theory has um, to, to look at quantum physics, which uh, hooked me. And, and it's the thing that I like the most. And it's the fact that Everett was, was seeking uh, unifications. So this is evident in, in many parts of his thesis, but I think, for example, this nice um, sentence could be like a nice starting point where he says that his present, his thesis is devoted to showing that the concept of the universal wave mechanics together with the necessary correlation machinery for its interpretation forms a logically self-consistent description of a universe in which several observers are at work. And um, with this starting point and you know, with the work of, of many people, including many of the people who are today at this conference, I think um, it's, it's very beautiful that there is one way of looking at quantum theory that allows us to consider it as a, as a universal theory in a consistent way. Um, now, just a disclaimer, what I'm going to say from now on with the thing I'm going to call quantum theory is unitary quantum theory understood through the Everett interpretation. So I won't sort of all the time say unitary quantum theory, but that's what I mean. And I also intend it not just as um, an assignment of a wave function to the universe, but I also regard it as um, uh, you know, the, the set of formal and informal statements with which you specify things like interactions uh, between subsystems, um, so Hamiltonians or Lagrangians or whatever. And this is in connection to the discussion we had yesterday. Uh, I think quantum theory means exactly that. So it's not just states, but also interactions and, and uh, dynamical laws and so on. Okay, so the three most interesting unifications that I think Everett um, contributed to or uh, also inspired are these. So one is the unification of the measuring apparatus and the systems that are to be measured. Uh, in this way, you know, we have a nice way of looking at uh, quantum theory is a um, fully universal mm, description of what's going on in the universe. Um, also allows us to have a, a nice unified picture of the other most fundamental theory of physical reality we have, which is general relativity, 
um, because um, quantum dynamics, if regarded in this unitary way, um, is both local in the sense it satisfies this uh, very strict notion of no action at a distance and deterministic. Um, and finally, there is this very nice step, which is the unification of quantum and classical universal models of computation, which isn't something that ever directly uh, brought about, but I think um, it's, it's undeniable that, that um, one has to take quantum theory seriously in order to think about and understand um, quantum information and the universal quantum theory machine. And it's on this particular point that I want to um, focus. That's why it's in red. Uh, because there is um, uh, an element that's missing from um, the quantum theory of information. Um, and, and it's something that when, um, when, when we'll find it, when we'll create and find this new, uh, this element that's currently missing, um, will bring about a further unification. So if you open a textbook on quantum information or any of the nice papers that uh, laid its foundations, uh, most of the theorems that are um, proven there are uh, fully based on the formalism of quantum theory. So in a way, it's an information theory, but it's, it's really uh, heavily um, based on the machinery of quantum theory. And this is not satisfactory because um, the information theoretic concepts are um, by definition more general than any specific dynamics. And it would be desirable to have, um, to have a more general way of proving these statements, which only relies on information theoretic aspects and doesn't refer to specific um, elements of quantum theory's formalism. So what I'm thinking about is something which you know, we might call for fun, quantum information without quantum theory. Uh, and this is what I found very promising in this idea that David Deutsch had, um, which is kind of called the constructor theory program uh, that um, he put forward uh, around about the time I was doing my PhD. Um, in order to generalize the quantum theory of computation. And one of the aspects in which the generalization should go is exactly uh, this one. So trying to emancipate the quantum theory of information from specific features of quantum theory's dynamics. Now, what does it have to do with, um, with the universality of quantum theory? Well, it has a lot to do with it. And that's what I found uh, really promising in, in, in constructor theory itself. So to, to see why this is interesting, um, we have to consider a problem. And this problem is um, best introduced by some kind of example. Um, so the, the, the problem arises in this context where one can question the universality of the quantum multiverse when uh, there are some rival theories that might be describing other subsystems of the universe which may not um, obey quantum theory. So of course, gravity is one of the traditional ones that are being suggested, uh, but there could be others. And so I want to stay general. So Q is this quantum sector of the universe. S is some other sector that um, may or may not obey quantum theory and um, therefore in a way somehow challenges this idea of, of the fact that um, the multiverse or quantum theory itself is actually universal. Um, so the question is, is it possible to have a system of this kind? So where there is a quantum system and there is another system that doesn't obey quantum theory and somehow they are coexisting and interacting with each other. And of course, the, the answer to the question depends on how one defines uh, the interaction and also on what one means by, what, what we mean by non-quantum. Uh, and this is where constructor theory is useful. But before going to that, let's um, consider one answer to this question that was uh, given um, a while ago by uh, Bryce DeWitt. So uh, DeWitt had this um, somewhat humorous way of, of talking about um, what he called the totalitarian property of quantum theory. 
uh, which goes as follows. Uh, the, so the quantization of a given system, Q, uh, implies also the quantization of any other system to which you can be coupled. And so that means the quantum theory, um, so therefore so the quantum multiverse and so on, must immediately be extended to all physical systems, including the gravitational field. Uh, of course, he was interested in this problem because he was trying to find arguments to support the program of quantizing gravity. But I'd like to consider this um, statement of the Witts as a um, uh, general statement about any system that may or may not obey quantum theory. And um, in this sense, I think I, I regard this as a very interesting uh, statement. So it's somehow the Witt was suggesting, and he has a proof um, of this, that um, if you have um, some reasonable assumptions about dynamics um, of two sectors, one being quantum, the other one being classical, then, um, and you make them interact, then somehow the classical system has got to pick up some quantum features. Now, this uh, statement has been made in different ways. Uh, there are some works by uh, Paris and Terno, um, and uh, also uh, by Page and Galke, who have um, suggested ways of, of bolstering this type of statement, and others. Uh, but also it's been questioned. So, uh, you know, Sudarshan collaborators work and uh, Holm and Reginato, some of them, I think there are lots of um, different proposals for interacting classical uh, and quantum um, fundamental models for dynamics. So now I would like to suggest um, a way to um, move forward uh, from this theorem that the wit proved and in a way that we can make it stronger and this will use constructor theory. Um, so one aspect in which the wit argument can be improved is, is that just like quantum information, um, as I said before, um, it assumes many dynamic specific features. So it uses things like um, Lagrangian mechanics and um, other aspects of the, of the formalism that, come, that come, comes with it. So it would be very desirable to make it more general, to um, make it stronger and try to relax some of these assumptions. And so we can use, um, my suggestion is to use constructor theory to, to do that. So now I'll enter a digression. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about constructor theory um, and then I'll go back to showing two possible ways in which we can improve on the Witts argument. Um, okay, so constructor theory, um, you can think of it as um, a meta theory. So it's something that exists as a sort of deeper level than say any particular dynamics. Um, in order to make sense of its statements, you have to assume already to be given a theory with some uh, set of allowed states and a partition to subsystems um, and other things that I won't list here. Um, but um, the point is that you don't have to fix a particular dynamics. And um, then you can define um, attributes to sets of states. And then the main objects of constructed theory are tasks. And these are, if you like, the generalization of computational tasks. So they are um, uh, sets of um, all the pairs of input output attributes to specify a physical transformation. And they can be allowed or disallowed in a specific way that I'm going to explain in a moment. Uh, and the best way to talk about um, how a task can be allowed or disallowed is to talk about the constructor. And that's where the theory gets its name. Um, so a constructor for a given task uh, can be modeled within a particular dynamical theory as a system that's part of the environment um, of the system in which you want to perform the task, which can be coupled to this system, bring about the transformations stated by the task, and crucially um, stays unchanged in its ability to do it again. So um, for example, in quantum theory, you can think of it as say um, a, a subspace, which is invariant under some, um, the dynamical laws that you are uh, considering. Uh, but in Indo-B quantum theory, it could be a more general type of dynamics. And um, the name comes from von Neumann who, uh, 
thought of this uh, generalization of the quantum the of the um, Turing machine, which he called the universal constructor. Uh, but in this case, constructors are actually much more general um, entities and they don't have to be universal. Um, okay, so why is this constructor, the concept of the constructor useful? Well, because um, the key aspect of it, the fact that it stays unchanged in its ability to cause a transformation again, allows one to uh, abstract it away from the description and then only phrase uh, principles or the laws of constructor theory um, as requirements on um, whether a constructor is or isn't allowed um, to be approximated to arbitrarily high accuracy. And so that's how we end up defining what it means for a task to be possible or impossible. So a task is impossible if there's a law of physics that forbids um, it's being performed to arbitrarily high accuracy and otherwise it's possible. And of course, you can think of many examples um, of laws that say that some tasks are impossible. Uh, for example, um, statement of no cloning uh, theorem is, is one way in which you can think of it as, as forbidding the task of cloning um, in, for the case of quantum theories. Um, you can think of the conservation of energy as another such statement and so on. Um, now, this is interesting because statements that are formulated with possible and impossible um, tasks uh, become scale independent and exact. And it's all because you have abstracted away this constructor. Uh, and that's the key aspect uh, of constructor theory. And that's why it's interesting. And it allows us to make some meta statements about dynamical laws without specifying any particular one, just requiring that they are compatible with the general constructor theoretic principles. Okay, so now I'll specialize to the constructor theory of information, which is um, a particular kind of application of constructor theory, which will be then useful for our problem of generalizing the Witts argument. Okay, so um, the constructor theory of information something I've been working on with David. Um, it's a way of, uh, let's say, achieving two things. One is that it uh, unifies, uh, provides a framework to unify classical and quantum information in a way that uh, doesn't rely on probabilities, it's exact, and it uh, doesn't rely on quantum and classical dynamics, which is why we're using it in this particular talk. But there's another aspect to it, which is also very interesting, and it's the fact that it's an attempt to provide conjectured physical principles that are necessary for what we informally call information to be uh, embodied in physical systems. So often when we uh, talk about the physical theory or even about the theory of information as classically conceived, we assume many regularities to be out there in nature in the form of interactions being possible or allowed. And constructive theory of information provides um, a statement of what some of these regularities are. And they're all in terms of um, principles that, that um, uh, dynamics that can support information should obey. So that you can think of them as a bit like the, again, the conservation of energy or the principles of thermodynamics. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll uh, now explain a bit of a few of these, of these uh, principles because they are useful for the generalization of the, the Witts argument. So the first thing we can do with the constructed theory of information is to define a class of physical systems that um, are capable of um, instantiating information. And when I say this, you know, people might say, oh, but what do you mean by information? Well, um, I'm taking information now as an informally defined concept and I'm now indirectly providing a physical definition for it by conjecturing the regularities that have to be out there in order for um, information processing to take place. And so the first thing you do is to define this class of systems that we call information media. Um, you can think of these as systems that can contain what is broadly called classical information. So an information medium is a system with a set of um, disjoint attributes on which you have a, a set of tasks being possible. Uh, so all the permutation tasks and the copy task. 
Now, uh, very simple example, a bit with two attributes zero and one, uh, the permutation tasks are uh, these, and the copy task is this one down here. Um, so it, therefore you can think of it as a generalization of um, a control knot. And so a system with these properties is called an information medium and the set X is called an information variable. So it's a set of attributes that can be permuted in all possible ways and copied. Then there is this principle that we conjectured, which is called the interoperability principle for information. And this says that um, if you have two information media, each of which satisfies the definition, you put them together, um, no matter what the dynamics, uh, specific dynamics is, they've got to satisfy this, fact, this uh, requirement that uh, when you consider the joint system, it itself is still an information medium with an information variable that's a Cartesian product of the two separate information variables. And so if you figure out what this means in terms of permutations at the level of the global system, this basically implies that uh, information variables must be copyable from any information medium to any other information medium that has uh, at least the same capacity. And um, so this is a conjectured law of nature, if you like, um, and this will be used later for the, for the proof of, of the generalized Lewitz argument. Now, David and I also um, added a constraint on information media. So you can think of um, uh, a restricted class of information media that we call super information media. And these are uh, systems that should provide a generalization of, of, of quantum systems, of systems that can support um, at least qualitatively all of the features of um, quantum information processing. And Specifically, an information so a super information medium is is an information medium with at least two information variables, say x and y, uh, whose union isn't an information variable. And again, just an example to understand what I'm talking about: um, a qubit qualifies as a super information medium with um, two variables corresponding to two different um, uh, bases, because when you take the union of those two sets, x and y. Uh, for example, you can't copy the resulting set. Um, and so that's one example, but the idea is that this is a more general, it's not using any of quantum theory specific features to talk about this, um, this particular class of media. And finally, you can prove that um, there is this kind of structure between information media, super information media and, and quantum systems. So, Super information media have all the qualitative properties of quantum systems, which is why quantum systems are like a, a sub element of, of this um, super information media set. And information media are this more general um, set here. And note that this can be proven exactly, so we're not using probabilistic um, schemes or, or approximations of sorts. And this is quite nice because it gives us a framework where we can basically talk about generalized uh, quantum systems in, in, a, in this nice exact way. And also, um, I later proved that there is a subset of super information media obeying uh, some additional constraints for which you can construct, um, for which you can construct probabilities in much the same way as you can for quantum theory with a decision theory type argument. Uh, which is also nice because then we have a quantitative handle on certain phenomena, chiefly things like entanglement. So in this framework, you can define qualitatively and we are hoping quantitatively also most of the quantum information features of quantum systems, which is uh, very nice. And it's very nice because it can help us with our task, the task that I set um, to myself at the start of the talk, which was to generalize um, the wits argument. So let's go back to that. We need an additional small step, which is that we need to talk about the notion of non-classicality within this new super information framework. Um, and non-classicality is a slightly lesser feature than um, uh, being, uh, you know, than, than super information. Um, and it's, it's the property that the system has at least two variables, X and Z, so two sets of non-overlapping attributes 
uh, which is also disjoint from one another, um, with the property that um, it is impossible to copy uh, them jointly to um, arbitrary high accuracy. And this generalizes the familiar notion of, of the fact that the X and Z don't commute. It's just that it does in, the, in this operational way that doesn't use an explicit formalism to, to, to state the condition for being non-classical. And as I said, this is a lesser property than being even quantum, because for instance, um, if Z is an information variable, something that can be measured, X may not be. Um, it also could be that X uh, isn't uh, fully permutable and, and so on. Okay, now we've got uh, all the ingredients. We can go back to um, the task. And the task was, sorry, to provide this generalized information theoretic argument for, for what the wit called the totalitarian property of quantum theory. This is some work that um, I, I did with Vlad Covedro. Um, out also of the fact that I think uh, Vladko was largely concerned or uh, dissatisfied with the fact that some of these properties, these general principles that we had in constructor theory uh, didn't have a um, connection with, with, with uh, you know, immediately uh, testable things. And I think um, so um, this, this work is bridging the gap between these principles that are very general and abstract and something that could actually be tested. Um, so we assume three general principles now. Locality, uh, I won't say more about locality. It's a stronger property than no signaling. And I think uh, Paul Raymond Robichaud will later talk about it in all the details. Um, interoperability of information, which I defined earlier. And then there is this third requirement, which is um, not quite right what I wrote there, because it's, um, it's a more involved type of requirement. But for the purpose of this talk, it's something that requires um, the subsidiary theories of constructor theory, the dynamics that obey uh, constructor theory to be one to one, so logically reversible. And uh, so, with these assumptions, we can prove a nice theorem. And the theorem says that um, if it's possible to couple a super information medium Q with an information medium S through a copy like interaction, then S must be non classical. And um, so this is the attempted generalization of the Witts statement in a way that doesn't rely on specific dynamical laws. And now there is a, there is a further step that we can take, which is interesting. Um, so we, we can ask, is it possible to drop um, one of these three assumptions in order to prove this totalitarian property of um, super information or quantum theory or, quant or quantum, quantum theory? Uh, and we can do that by adding, um, instead of having just one super information medium, having two of them. So you can uh, use two super information media, which I call here Q and Q prime, and formulate a statement of this kind, which says, assume locality and assume the interoperability of information. Um, if the, the system S that you're trying to show has to be quantum can uh, mediate locally um, entanglement between these two, two super information media, so Q and Q prime, then S must be uh, non-classical in the sense that I said earlier. And when I say entanglement, I don't mean uh, entanglement defined in, within quantum theory. I mean, it, uh, it can be defined at least at the qualitative level within the super information framework. So um, we are uh, still dynamics independent when we, when we formulate this uh, theorem and when we prove it. So that's the second version of how to generalize uh, the Witt's argument for the totalitarian property of uh, quantum theory. And I find this very interesting. Um, I'd like to hear what you think about it. But I think the reasons why I find this interesting is that uh, so this Principles that underlie the theorems are um, nicely expressed in terms of statements that are not dependent on specific dynamics and they're independent of the scale, which is in general a feature of constructor theory. Um, and the other thing is that uh, the second theorem that I mentioned 
uh, suggests actually a class of experiments which one can perform in order to uh, check, in order to provide a witness of uh, whether an unknown system S is or isn't um, quantum, or in fact, I would say is or isn't classical. In the sense that if this mediator S can act as a channel um, to create entanglement between these two other systems, uh, then uh, we can conclude that, that um, S is actually um, non-classical. So all classical models for S should be um, discarded, provided that they satisfy these two axioms of locality and interoperability of information. And this is nice because it ties in with some recent experiments that were proposed a bit along the line of uh, also what um, Paige and collaborators had proposed uh, quite a while ago um, to test quantum effects in gravity through uh, probing it with two uh, quantum masses. But the reason why I find this interesting is mostly this more general theoretical reason that I, I regard these results as a first step towards providing um, a host of generalizations of these results that we have in quantum information theory without having to assume the specific features of quantum theory. And so in a way, this is a, a bit like a generalization of um, Bell's theorem, if you like. So in the case of, or at least it has the same logic, let's say. Um, in the case of Bell's theorem, uh, you can rule out a host of um, models for um, certain, systems that, that display certain kinds of, of, of correlations that violate given inequalities. In this case, um, it's very nice that under some axioms, just like in the case of Bell's theorem, you can rule out a, a host of models that are classical for this um, system S. Um, so I think I am almost at the end of the talk in the sense that I'll leave this, uh, you know, the ending, the ending point is a question. So does, does this um, result and others that we have hint at the fact that we might be able to uh, provide a theory of the quantum multiverse, which actually be, goes beyond quantum theory itself, its formalism and, and so on. And then if that's the case, what are the features that we, um, of the formalism of quantum theory and uh, that we might be happy to uh, part with and, um, you know, I have some thoughts, for example, could it be the um, equivalence between the Schrodinger and the Heisenberg picture? Um, um, perhaps we should question more things like the superposition principle. Um, and, and, um, and I think some of the talks that will come today or perhaps in the next few days will um, kind of discuss a little bit these things. Uh, but mostly this question is for you, uh, in a way that, um, you know, I think this kind of audience understands quantum theory in, in a very deep way, and it would be nice to hear your thoughts. And so on this note, I think I'll just stop the talk, and I'm very happy to have a conversation and uh, answer questions. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Chiara. Thank you very much. I would, uh, if everyone wants to join me for clapping, please go ahead. Great. Thank you. So uh, we have uh, plenty of time for questions. Um, the, there is one uh, hand that is raised by uh, Professor Don Page. Uh, Don Page, if you would like to unmute yourself. And, yeah. Yeah. Hi, I was trying to take one an example of this, although it, it, when you talked about something other than quantum theory, I don't know. I don't think it satisfies any, a lot of the uh, axioms you propose later, but it occurred to me that consciousness might be something because, I mean, it, it, it seems like you can't, as far as I can see, there's no way to logically deduce consciousness from, from, you know, from quantum theory or from the quantum state. You need something, you know, you need something else. So it may be, I, the simplest view seems to me that it supervenes on the quantum state that, that for example, I propose that the measure for for our conscious perceptions that is given by the expectation values of certain of certain operators, but then the, the state in the Heisenberg picture doesn't change at all in this simplest version. But but Andre Lindy has proposed that maybe consciousness could even have an effect back on the back on the on the state. But I don't know, I, I don't know about the 
these tasks you talked about, I'm not quite sure consciousness could do, it could do that sort of thing. But I just, I mean, it does seem to be something that, that isn't, isn't explicitly quantum. I'm although certainly it's, it must be, there must be a cycle of physical parallelism relating it to that, but it, but in some sense it might, it's, you know, it's different from, from, from the quantum theory. And I, I wondered whether anything that you worked on might apply to that. Well, um, I think in regard to consciousness, we are um, somehow, you know, we, in a way we are, we're very far from, from having an exact theory of it within physics. And it's even questionable whether that's, uh, you know, that's, that's possible at all. Um, however, because I, you know, I think um, I, I'd like to think that, that uh, whatever we are doing with, with the brain is actually, um, uh, some kind of, 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 of computation. So I'd, uh, I'd, I'd hope that some of these principles that I mentioned, uh, for example, this interoperability principle and so on, uh, should also underlie whatever is the particular program that we are running when we, when we think. Um, now, whether that is uh, going to violate the laws of quantum theory or not is uh, I think is an open question. I don't have any reason to expect that that's the case, uh, but who knows, maybe it is. And if that's the case, then um, hopefully these principles, because they're more robust than quantum theory itself, should survive and should um, still be valid. Uh, but I don't know if this answers your question. I, I don't think we have thought specifically about consciousness in, in, this, uh, in this work. Um, and also I should say, um, that that uh, in general, I think we have a very poor understanding, uh, you know, from, from the, we've got like a descriptive understanding of consciousness and some theories that say why it's compatible with underlying dynamical laws and so on. Uh, but I don't think we have an explanatory theory for it yet, um, other than maybe at this higher level. So I don't know, I, I, I yeah, I, I can only speculate about some of these things and, um, in fact, I'm interested to know whether you know you people have different views. One one crazy idea I had. That I don't think it's very plausible, but if it were true, it would be extremely exciting. And that is, it seems to me that our consciousness depends on something non-local in the brain. If it was completely local, just localized to a point, you'd only have a few fields or something that could. It's it's surely what when we're conscious of something, it depends on some some region spread over the brain. Now, in the view I think is most plausible that it's an epiphenomenon, then the expectation values of some operators maybe give this consciousness, but they don't act at all on the quantum state. But if you raise the possibility that these non-local operators acted on the quantum state, that acted, that contributed to the Hamiltonian, there conceivably could be non-local communication or non-local signals sent across whatever region you know has these conscious of. so I, I don't put this out as something I think is very plausible but it does occur to me and that maybe the one chance in a million that it might be well I don't I don't know I'd even give it that high a probability but one chance of a million that it might be right it would be extremely exciting if we could see that there's non-local propagation of information inside of conscious beings all it raises all sorts of ethical questions of how you'd test that yeah, I mean, the, the somehow slightly bad news is that if uh, things are non-local, then the theory of information we have doesn't apply. So um, we might have to rethink about, you know, for, for you know, for making sense of the model you have, we might have to rethink about things like even just um, what it means to independently prepare a subsystem, measure it, and so on. So all of these notions I mentioned are based on locality, and it's a strong locality property. Like um, as I said, I think uh, I mean, yeah, let's say like. Like the locality properties satisfied by by uh, quantum field theory at the level of Q numbered uh, operators, um, but yeah, I'm, I'm as I said, I mean this is not specifically what this theorem should be useful for, but um, yeah, I'm, you know maybe we can discuss a bit more about these specific models you have. I, I, I'm not. I'm not. This is not the center of my thinking. I'm also curious because it. It, it seems like quantum gravity is non-local in the sense that, 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 that there's the constraint equations that the energy of the system is recorded by the gravitational field all the way at infinity. 
and so if you know if you have if you have an energy eigenstate say if it's asymptotically flat or something if you have an energy eigenstate there's no way to change the that the, the there's no way that you could make a change in the quantum state inside without changing it all the way out at infinity. So I don't think this permits signal propagate, propagating signals fast in light, but I mean, I think it does mean it's impossible, even if God, suppose God just said, I'm going to keep general relativity and, and so on, he could not change the state in, in the middle of the system without changing it all the way out to infinity because of the constraint equation. So I'm, I'm curious because it, it seems like quantum gravity is not local. I'm well, I, th I think the, so perhaps non-locality, unfortunately, is a very loaded uh, word. The way I think about it is dynamical and, and somewhat counterfactual. So it's about uh, the fact that if you were to change um, some, so if you've got like two space, like separated subsystems, and you were to interact with only one of them, um, the other shouldn't change. And to think about this, you would have to change the constraints. To think, to, you would have to set up a dynamically um, evolving situation where you're considering what happens if you were to do this and that. So in that sense, I think it's compatible with the with, so with the, with the kind of quantum gravity models you 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 were referring to. But of course, I do, you know I'm happy if if you know quantum gravity experts are around if they want to say something about it. But I think it's, the locality I'm talking about is compatible with with what you are referring. Um, well, it's certainly a very ap approximate locality, and that's kind of the mystery of some of the things, the firewall arguments that they, you know, if you assume precise locality, you get into these paradoxes, but, but uh, you know, if quantum theory is, if, if quantum gravity theory is really not completely local, then, then you can ameliorate the, the information loss problem for black holes. Um... Well, that is also, okay, that, that, that opens like another very broad uh, direction for discussion in the sense that, that that is also questionable whether there's a paradox or, um, so I, I, I think, um, well, I mean, yeah, I guess some of the derivations that are behind that claim are perhaps not taking, yeah, I, I, I think I'm, I'm, I quite like your take on, on that, on that uh, work. Um, on the on the you know the information loss paradox, but I think the derivation we have of it is are are themselves not um, fully consistent with unitary quantum theory. And then perhaps the paradox is just the fact that, as you I think suggested, there's um, there's some defect in the way the paradox is derived. Um, yeah. So do you want guys? We right. can. Perhaps pursue this discussion. We have a discussion period and we have breaks. If, if you want to, it would be good to have a, at least one more question. Um, there was a question in the chat by Scott Aronson. I see he is, uh, he's, he's put in his camera. So perhaps Scott, you want to uh, ask it yourself? Uh, sure. Yeah. So, I mean, I think, you know, one of the most basic questions that you can ask about any abstract framework is, you know, do you get out of it more than what you put in? Right. And so, um, you know, I, I want to understand better. So I was wondering, you know, if you could say something about like the proofs of your theorems of the necessity of totalitarianism. Like, is there an interesting trick beyond just sort of clearly spelling out, you know, what are the axioms of constructor theory and what do they say and so forth? Um, sorry. Well, the trick is, I would say the, the so the two tricks are, uh, this locality property uh so that's very strong that, that requiring mm. that um when you have so so it's 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 actually locality plus realism so i think again i'm, I'm entering the topic of, of a talk that will be given later mm. um so the fact that for example with the with qubits um you know if you look at them the way they behave in the Eisenberg picture and you make them interact with each other, uh, later on, the descriptors of each qubit depends on the descriptors of um, the other qubit at an earlier time in the, in the case of a general interaction. And there's nothing else um, that can specify the descriptor of a system at a later time as a function of the descriptors as, of systems at earlier times. That's one very strong uh, requirement, which happens to be true of the theories we know, but uh, you know, that could be questioned. And the other one is the interoperability principle because it kind of requires all of these copy-like interactions to be allowed between subsystems. 
uh, that's quite strong. Although I have to say, physically, from the physics point of view, I think it's it's um, nicely plausible in the sense that it's a reasonable requirement for theories to be testable and so on. So um, the nice thing about the theorem is, I think, the fact that these axioms are um, physically well motivated and they are general. So I think the the appealing aspect is that you don't have to specify a specific formalism to derive it beyond the various properties that you require of theories to be expressed in terms of tasks. Um, but yeah, I agree with you that axioms are, in a way, they are the explanation for why you get the result. I, I absolutely agree with you. And in that sense, I regard them as maybe nicely explanatory of, of you know, how come we expect this totalitarian property to be, to, to be true. Uh, yeah, it's a nice question. Thanks. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Great. I see uh, Lev had a question. Um, please, Lev, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Chiara. Uh, I think it was uh, very interesting. But uh, first, a comment. I don't think, at least, at least in my understanding, this is not the spirit of Everett. Everett wanted uh, to believe that quantum mechanics is end of story. It's, uh, you are not supposed to go anything further. This is uh, the quantum mechanics explain everything and what it doesn't look like, we have to find a quantum mechanical explanation. But uh, my question is that uh, this approach is very strongly uh, relies on the concept of information. Mm -hmm. I understand it's important. I have to know how to send messages that how we can manipulate and whatever. I'm less, uh, it's less clear for me that this is a basis of understanding the universe. And you said very little. You said that everyone can understand whatever he wants about information. I think you should give much more motivation and explanation why information is important to understanding the universe. OK, that's very, so OK, the first point is easy to address in the sense that we are standing on the shoulders of Everett. So we're trying to do, I was kind of trying to do kind of along the lines of, of what the, the title of the conference is um, suggesting. I was certainly going beyond whatever he was suggesting in his thesis. And as I said, I was inspired by this uh, interest for unifying things further. Um, OK, so about information, it's a very long um, answer that I should give. But I think in short, um, there is a so what we're, what we're trying to do with this stuff isn't to take information as fundamental and then build a theory of the universe on information. That isn't what we would like to do. What this is supposed to do is to, um, just like thermodynamics did for things like energy and heat, for instance, um, although that was done in a scale dependent way, but for the moment, forget about that. So just like thermodynamics did that thing for, for energy, um, we'd like to have a theory of what it means for the stuff that we informally call information to be uh, embodied in physical systems. So what, what are the microscopic fundamental regularities that you must have in physical constituents of the universe for it to um, permit things like computers and information processing entities, more generally speaking? Uh, now, you could say, well, maybe that's not so interesting. I mean, I don't care what computers do. I so if that's your view, I completely, I mean, I, I can't argue with that, but I, I have the opposite view. I think um, the physics of computation has led to very deep, uh, seems to me, realizations about quantum theory, for example. Uh, and, and the hope is that somehow by studying the information theoretic structure of quantum theory, you could actually get at a deeper symmetry of it which is the one that's robust and will stay if should quantum theory be modified one day uh, or another. And I, I know, Lev, that you don't like to think of dropping quantum theory, but this is, let's say, an attempt to keep all of the nice things of quantum theory, unitary quantum theory, Everettian quantum theory, call it the way you like, um, even if we were, were you know, even, if, even in the case where we have to actually uh, modify its formalism. I don't know if this helps. But if not, we can maybe discuss it in a, a long discussion, maybe. Later. Thank you. I got the flavor. OK. This is a perfect point to um, uh, finish officially this, the, the session of Chiara. So let us uh, thanks again, Chiara, for your beautiful talk. If you want. And we can stop the recording.